Um, this is a newer, uh, I think this is the first cohort and we're going through the effect. And the idea is that we is decided to go ahead and uh, combine the first couple weeks of chapters into one. Um, so like chapter one and two will be this week, chapter three and four will be next week, uh, because the first half of the book is designed more for kind of the conceptual, what are some ways to think about the questions and uh, defining research. And then the second half of the book is actually where we get into learning the tools um, that are uh, going to allow us to build out um, the um, research questions and question of uh, design our research to answer those questions. Um, so I know I said I was going to do the PR for the slides afterwards, but I went ahead and just did it now just to make sure that it works. There was a few things that I need to adjust on here, but uh, these are available. If you clicked on the link um, at the top of the Slack channel, it will bring you to um, the shared slides. Um, and there's also the book and the signing up for here. So we don't have anyone signed up for next week, which is chapter three and four. Is there anyone that has interest or a desire to take those over or would like to not hear me talk again for another hour? Yeah, I think Sarah mentioned she was going to sign up for that, but um, if she is unable to, I, I, I can... I can take it. Okay. Um, so yeah, she's. Let me. I'll, I'll put something out on the Teams chat. Ask her if she's still, uh, you know, interested. If she's not, I'll do it. Okay. Yeah, she's gonna be. She says she's gonna be about ten minutes late, and it sounds. I think Abdu said he's gonna be usually ten minutes late as well. Um, I just realized I don't have the book here right in front of me, um, but I think we'll be okay. So chapter one. Uh, I guess first off, before we start on there, were, was there any general questions or comments about the? Uh, general setup of this uh, book club or the book itself or why it was selected. Okay. Uh, Aaron, you have posted a few uh, additional resources in the Teams channel, a couple, I think, after last uh, class meeting. So if this is something of interest, there's three books that you had posted there that are all open source. Um, one of them was one considered to do for here and the other two are ones that you would do after this one, is that correct? Uh, you know, I just wanted to put out some other resources. I, I think uh, the last one I posted was a causal machine learning uh, book, which was brand new to me. I just kind of learned about that last week. It looks really cool. Um, so I would say, yeah, uh, absolutely. After we've kind of dug into the the basics, that might be an interesting, you know, uh, follow-up book club for, for causal inference. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so... Um, what I'm going to do is I kind of distilled down kind of what I thought the main chapter learning objectives were, the key takeaways that you should be able to answer from here, and then kind of the broad questions uh, is what I put in there. So for chapter one, really was more of an introductory. It was a short chapter. It was really, can you describe what a good research question is, uh, what type of research question types there are, why research needs a design, and explain importance of a good research question. Uh, so looking in, I, I have the paper copy because I do better on that, but I left it in the other room, but pretty much a research question is a question that you plan to answer about how the world works. Um, so it needs to be well-defined, answerable, and understandable. Um, so they have brought up, uh, I think later, part of chapter two and chapter one kind of overlap with each other, but, you know, asking like, what's the best Bond movie? Um, you know, it's kind of hard to answer that because everyone has a different definition of what best means or um but so it needs to be answerable and well defined as in you know what era of bond movies had the highest grossing film sales or something like that where you can actually answer that with observable data uh, and it's not necessarily a sentiment um anyone want to add anything to this section that they found helpful is that So the main focus that we're uh, looking at is empirical research, um, which is using structured observations. So getting away from um, reason and using less interviews and actually observing systems and using data sets that were collected off of it. 
And quantitative empirical research is just quantitative measurements, so numbers. Um, and you know, so it, it sounds easy, and he mentioned this throughout that all of these seem at high level very easy concepts, but it's very hard to actually put into practice. Uh, you know, collecting data is difficult. It's hard um, to get the resources, even to figure out how to get it. Um, but he's uh, wants to. He thinks that there's ways to design your research so that it best answers the question um, with the right data. Um, so what he what he's talking about for a lot of this section is a lot of times the numbers that we actually get are not answering or directly applicable to answering the question that we have in the research. So he brought up a conversation about do the number of lanes of traffic uh, a highway impact traffic, and we might measure the number of cars. But the number of cars don't actually tell us the answer to our question. We need a lot more context. So, uh, you know, we may need to uh, factor in like trends over time or something like that. So we need to understand what calculations we need to do to um, that data, or we need to take in other uh, contextual information such as, well, maybe busier roads already needed wider lanes so those roads are now just as busy or busier where if you did the same thing in smaller ones you know it doesn't really have much of an impact so really we want the right data to answer the question and design research will ensure that we set up to collect the correct data to answer our question or we understand the calculations needed to answer our question and you'll see, I, I'm repeating my same self about basically we just have questions that we need to answer, and that's what the research is doing, answering, giving us the ability to answer those questions. Um, and the other term he repeats quite a bit is how the world works. Um, so uh, you'll hear those a couple times here. <clears throat> oh, sorry. So any thoughts or anybody have ex any experience with empirical research or when you've had the wrong data for the right question or... Right question for the wrong data. Uh, so why research needs a design? Again, the data needs to be capable to answer the question. Um, you also need to be able to know, like, you know, the first time I did this, it didn't work out. What do I need to do instead? So sometimes you know what doesn't work. Now you got to figure out what could possibly work. So, um, you know, it's not a set in stone, one correct way to do it up front. You kind of have to figure out what that might be. Um, he really talked about nutrition research because uh, I think this is relatable to a lot of people where it seems like every other day, whatever you're eating is going to um, cause you to drop dead tomorrow or, you know, it's now the newest, healthiest thing that will make you live to 200. But the idea here is basically it's he uses that as an example of you know, the question that it's trying to answer is like, you know, what foods are the healthiest? There's not really research that can answer that. There's a lot of um, different measurements. Everyone's health considerations are different and they're not actually answering the full question. Um, and that leads to inconsistent results, which people cannot rely on or use. So, you know, that's where we get these diet fads where new research suggests, you know, high carb, low fat, and then the next set of research is high fat, low carb, and then the next research is, you know, whatever else. Um, so again, that question was not really well-defined because, you know, it is such a broad thing and health is not specific to just one factor. There's multiple factors that need to be consistent or need to be evaluated on that. And usually the thing of, you know, too much of a good thing is bad. So if you ate just the healthiest food ever, it's probably not going to be the healthiest food for you. Um, you know, and when you're designing your research, you might end up finding that, um, you know, it's just too difficult of a question to answer. So you at least know that you have to go back to the drawing board and figure out how do you reframe the question. Uh, it's still a takeaway. It's still valuable to know this, but um, it catches you early on than going through the whole process and then being like, I only answered part of this, but my p-value is below 0 0.05, so we're good to publish, right? Um, but yeah, so any uh, thoughts or 
takeaways on that nutrition research. I don't even know what the newest diet fads are. Are they uh, high protein still, of a uh, high fat, high protein, or is it more vegetables? Alcohol is bad for you uniformly, I think is one of the latest and greatest things. The one or one or two drinks a day apparently uh, is not good. Yeah, because it's interesting. It's so similar. Like they always convince us that the Mediterranean diet of having like one to two glasses of red wine a day was the reason why everyone's healthy, but it was more just like general lifestyle in general. I what is it called when you like have that self fulfilling pr prophecy where it's like you want to you like drinking coffee, so you're gonna look out and find the results that support that coffee yeah. is. Uh, good for you. And sorry, I'm drinking coffee. So I was on a meeting earlier in the week where coffee was banned because some people could not have access to it. And I was jokingly banned, but sorry if you're craving coffee. But yeah, so I mean, those are the types of things that you got to think about is like, you you, you don't want to already come in there, like, with a question that you already know the answer. He talks about that more in chapter two about you know, if you find something that is inconsistent and it doesn't change your viewpoint, it wasn't really a good uh, research question. So if I like drinking coffee and I find out like, you know, coffee, coffee is the worst thing ever. And I'm like, oh, whatever, I don't care. Then it wasn't really a good research question or the data wasn't set up proper. The design wasn't set up properly. And then he concludes the chapter here with book goals. So the first half again is ways to build answerable research questions and think about quantitative empirical research to perform to answer the question. And the second half is where we're actually going to be working on using observational data to answer questions and explore the tools that are widely applicable to answer many questions. Um, so that's, that's this one here. Um, I open it up to a uh, you know, if we wanted to add anything here or anything I missed, um, I can put it in there. But anyone have anything they want to discuss or examples or resources that they found helpful as going through this first chapter? Nothing for me. No, thanks. So I'm not sure what's going to happen since our first meeting landed here. Um, so I don't know if the first meeting... Today's meeting is probably going to end up in research question two, but I guess we'll find out when that there. But if you come back here and you missed it or want to review something, um, they do get posted afterwards. Oh, um, we also talked about last week the additional materials section here on the website. It looks like very small up here. It could be easily missed, but there is a video series here as well as code. Um, in order to work through the data sets provided, you'll have to download the package Causal Data. This is something that I added to the book club. Um, I'm not sure, so now that there's a PR, I don't think any of you all will have to download it separately, but just in case um, you run into any issues, know that that's part of it. Um, and there was a homework assignments with chapter two, which we can go, af go to after looking at um, I'll just download this because I forgot to grab that. So I, I only have three learning objectives here. So basically further defining what a research question is and uh, what is a good research question and then comparing data mining versus research questions um, and then ways that you can determine if a question is good. And I know good is a broad one, but basically is, you know, is it worth pursuit? Um, so this was covered over across the sections, but pretty much a research question is goes beyond just itself. It's supposed to help you improve your understanding of how the world works. So if you just have something that, you know, you answer, it's a simple yes or no, it's not really a research question, you want to know more about why things happen or why this exists. Um, and it needs to result in a believable answer. Um, you know, you can't answer a question with something that is not uh, repeatable or replicable or is so, 
not able to be understood that it's you know, so on. And it's answerable with evidence. So data that you've actually collected or observed. Um, and again, the, they wanna avoid the ambig ambiguous questions. Uh, nice guest joining us, um, partially. Uh, but um, like, I got you're not phased. You're just like, yep, I'm used to this. I'm gonna have to lean over and stay in the camera, but um, yeah. Yeah, so best, you want to, instead of thinking, you know, like, what was the best movie, which again, you probably asked five different people, like, there's not a consistent way to answer that. Yeah, there are things like IMDb scores, but again, there's lots of factors to consider. Um, there was a recent um, release of, like, Yelp scores, like, who, what is the demographics of a typical Yelp uh, reviewer, and it is not consistent with the general demographics of, um, you know, the general, if we just said, you know, what's the most popular movie in America, you know, it's it's not representative of overall America. It was actually, we found that the majority of the Yelp reviewers were uh, younger female Asians, um, which is only a subset of there. So even those types of, um, um, you know, scores you know, need to be considered, but rather than asking best, it's be something tangible, like, you know, which movie sold the most, which could be answerable but like just answering that question doesn't really help us understand why the world works but if we can understand like you know during the 80s um which uh you know adventure uh why were adventure movies or which um movie type was had the highest sales and is that reflective of the geopolitical la uh landscape and that's where he pursues where like taking the bond one instead of saying you know what's the best bond movie to which one had the highest grossing to talking about you know why that specific era had the highest grossing uh could answer the question of you know the 80s because of end of cold, cold war or some other um thing like that and so that's kind of taking the question from just answering the question and being oh that's cool it's a nice trivia question to what does that tell me about how things were or why they were? So one of the um, people I work with, uh, another one did their uh, thesis on um, how media reflects the current trends. Um, so if there's like a movie, uh, if there's a like a moon landing, there's a lot of movies that now pop up about aliens and space and so on. Whereas, you know, if it's some other major event, there'll be a lot more content towards that. And it should also inform theory. So answering something broader than itself. And he narrows down to a theory is just a way to tell us why. And it can be true or false, but it, it, you're at a starting point and explains why we might see the out, see outcomes. And the good question should take us from that theory to a hypothesis. So it helps us to improve ability to explain why. And really it's answering if the theory holds, what should I expect to observe is pretty much what that process is. And we also want to get something new about the why. Like, we don't want to do a research question that just tells us something that doesn't change our mind or isn't exciting, I think is what he had mentioned later on. Um, so we want to make sure that we have a reason for answering this question beyond just answering the question. Um, and he did mention further down more, but I put it in here, is that theory can come first and then the research question or research question can be the starting point that leads into the theory. So those are interchangeable and depending on the source of the the questions, you know, you may see this alternate, but that's not a requirement to have it theory first and research question. And again, the goal, <clears throat> write data for the right questions. <clears throat> you could answer a question that doesn't answer, sorry, you can collect data that doesn't answer your question, but it could inform a theory somewhere else. So just because it's not the right data for your question or theory, it doesn't mean that it's bad data or anything. It just means that there might be another theory that it can inform uh, and so on. Um, and he proposed two conditions for it being a research question. Could we answer it? And does it tell us about how the world works? You can look at a question, ask the, and it passes both of those, then we can consider it to be a research question. But then the other component is, does it inform theory? 
So would unexpected results change your understanding of the world? This goes back to the, um, you know, if I drink coffee and it says, oh, this one study said that coffee is, you know, the worst thing ever for you. And I say, you know, okay, I'm just going to explain it away. Um, it's going to be a bad question. So in the book itself, he talks about viewership of TV and um, or, uh, creativity, imagination. And they're one of the pretty much went into it with a bias of, yeah, this makes sense. But then found this people who watch Sesame Street tended to have higher imagination and went through this whole spiel about being able to explain why that was not necessarily indicative of the overall situation and just kind of explain it away as in, even though this said something opposite, it doesn't really change what I'm thinking here. So th this is whether or not it informs theory. So if you can just say, oh, that's just a oddball occurrence that doesn't mean anything, or yeah, I know this, but it it's not going to change my mind. It's not the right um, question that informs the theory. Is this pace okay? Um, I'm kind of just reading through this, these as notes, but do you want me to slower, faster? Is this fine? Yeah, I, I think this is good. Uh, I'll just you know put in a comment just the idea that yeah you should come into any research with a theory is is important and I, I like that the author made the distinction about like data mining and how don't just let the data speak speak for itself that you can run into problems there and um i thought that was very um bayesian like right where you <laughs> come into a problem with a, a prior prior hypothesis and I, I don't know if any folks here have read um statistical rethinking I think oh, that was a book club at one point here. Um, but the author of that book is basically like, if you have even <laughs> a, a vague idea of, of how like a statistical model should work, you should incorporate that into your, your prior assumptions. Right. And, and that author um, spends a lot of time going through DAGs, right. The directed acyclic graphs that I think we're going to talk about um, in a few chapters here. So um very much in line with the, the the Bayesian philosophy, even if we're not, you know, explicitly talking about Bayes' role here. So this one came from from that we did a, I did this a couple of years ago. Richard McGrath, I think is his name. Yeah, yeah. And basically said like, you know, if you were to throw a a beach ball that's in the sh uh, is the represents the globe, and you threw it to someone, and whether or not they land on water or land when they catch it let's just say their right index finger um we know that generally the uh the world is made up of like 70 percent water roughly but say if we did the same experiment with a planet we've never seen before we don't know anything about it before but we know that there's either going to be water or land we can build out a you know as we collect evidence we can start to see that distribution form um, where initially first person that lands is a, Hey, it's lands on land. We have a hundred percent plausibility that it's a fully land. And then we second throw is a, as a water. We know now that, the, Hey, maybe there's a 50, 50 chance. And the more that you do that. So you're basically starting with the concept of, Hey, I have no prior information. This is all I have. And then you're updating it, um, as you go forward. But yeah, he's, he's very uh, energetic. I, I don't know if it's still all fully available online with his lectures and everything, but um, I, he did a really great job of explaining it, you know, all the possible outcomes and you know how that works on there. But I'm glad that, that was a book club uh, one. Of course, of course, that's more of a, I think a small sample size issue, right? Because if you have <laughs> all the data you want, which you never do, um, Right, the uh, the data kind of does speak for itself and overpowers the your prior assumption. But uh, in in any event, yeah, it's just it reading yeah. this chapter kind of made me think about that. Yeah, it also helps. Like at a certain point, you don't need you know a million observations if you can pretty much get there within you know a hundred observations and or so on based on you know, how it goes to that. But yeah, so. That's a good segue into you know data mining versus research questions. Uh, I feel like the author is pretty optimistic. Like, hey, just because it, it's bad here doesn't mean it's bad overall. So he usually gives both the pro and cons to different topics. Um, the data mining, if you're not fully familiar on it, is basically just finding patterns within data. Um, 
and using those to make predictions or eventually to make predictions under stability. So basically, if I took all everything as it is today and made a uh, prediction of where things are going, this is what the output would be based on these relationships. So things like correlation um, and, and so on. But it doesn't really address or uh, understanding. It's pretty much telling you what without the why behind it. So yes, there is a correlation between these two, but it doesn't tell you anything about causation. Um, so it answers what's in the data. Um, and a lot of people make the mistake of basically saying, hey, it's highly, highly correlated. So it means that they're one causes the other, which really it's more of this, that they have a relationship that's it's viewable. And he brings up the concept of like, with data mining and big data and everything, the more data that you compare to each other, eventually you're gonna end up with a random relationship that just doesn't make sense. But you check enough things, you're gonna find relations. And you know, you can get people starting to explain away things like, oh, this is this is uh because of this or whatnot. But uh so an example was uh wearing shorts and ice cream and basically saying if you know people wear shorts are more they're gonna buy ice cream or something. It's really that one doesn't cause the other, but the fact is, is that both of those seem to occur within the same seasons um, when it's warmer or so on. Um, and it's not completely useless to know that relationship because if you don't know one of them, you can, you can help predict, you know, you know, it kind of helps give you a sense of what to expect with it, but it doesn't actually tell you why. Um, and it doesn't deal with abstraction. This one was one that I had to read a few times to fully understand it. Um, so if anyone has a clearer way to explain this, but basically if you think of a chair, what a chair looks like to you, or that you know of a, what a chair is, like if you see something like, yeah, that's a chair, that is your chair theory. That's what you identify as a theory. But if you use data mining, you would find observations of that data, but you would never actually conclude the chair theory. Like you would see parts of it, but you wouldn't know how they all fit together to create a chair. And, you know, one of the things that might come up is that a, there's a beanbag chair, uh, one that doesn't have four legs. And in data mining, you couldn't quite understand how you weren't getting four chairs or something like that. I, that's That was basically one that you can see the observations, but it just doesn't develop into anything broader than itself. Is that how you took it away or anything that had that one? Yeah, it was a little bit of a convoluted uh, example. And it, 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 just, it made me think of generative AI, right? And it's like, well, are we at a point now where we have models that actually can uh, basically, you know, have, have, a, have a chair theory where, you, you know, it could, you know, you could have a, a model that would extrapolate to the beanbag chair, maybe. Um, but, but yeah, uh, I, I, I think that the, the point was, was taken, but yeah, the, the example was not super, you know, crystal clear in my mind. Yeah. I guess it's one of those things that I don't know why I, wrote, I remember this one, but it was, it's like, you know, we can tell what a horse is and you start defining what a horse is like it has four legs and whatever. And it's like, well, what if horse only has, this animal only has three legs. It's like, well, it's still a horse, but you know, you you just broke your rule of saying that a horse has four legs or something like that. So it's kind of like that theory of this is what a horse is and you can still identify a horse, even if it doesn't meet all of that criteria um, where data mining might not necessarily say, Hey, this is a horse, even though it has characteristics of it. I, yeah. So it was convoluted. So I don't think it's worth going further into it, but basically saying is that it doesn't go beyond observations to develop a theory or anything. Um, and, yeah, uh, uh, sorry. Um, sort of the way I think about this, and I don't, I don't think of this as necessarily how he was trying to frame it, but like you, the way I sort of think about it is like you can do data mining on chair shape, but without the chair theory, without the concept of like what is a chair in your head, those relationships are essentially meaningless. So it's, it, it, I don't know. I, I don't think this is where he was trying to go with it, but the way I kind of think about it is like data mining 
is good and all, but like without the theory part of it, it's just it's just like I have flat top with four legs. And then bringing in that theory is sort of like, okay, well, that means this might be a chair. Yeah, and that section is right in here is that you know, there's no chair in the data, I guess is a probably good concept. It's like we see components of it in, in there, but without that theory or that why or that conceptual part of it, we never put that together to create a chair. It's, yeah. Right. Data mining doesn't uh, address the why. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's, it's kind of in that one of those paragraphs there. Yeah. And the fact that he has a side note that Plato would, you know, die from reading this is telling me that it's pretty abstract of kind of understanding like it is a philosophical, philosophical question on it. But um, you, so far his, his ones were pretty clear and understandable. This one was a bit more abstract, which might be the reason because <laughs> data mining doesn't deal well with the abstraction. Um, um, but the other big one takeaway was that it uh, data mining results in false positives. Um, it, and I've never seen it said in this way. I've always seen it in more of the error checking way of, of calculating it. But basically, you're finding observations in the sample, but not outside of it. Um, so random relationships occur when you test everything. But if it occurs in your sample or what you're working on, but isn't replicable outside of it, that would be a false positive. Um, and then he mentions in the scheme of research that data mining isn't the best for these reasons, but it still is help, a helpful tool and can lead to research questions. Um, and so he gave uh, an example with medicine where they started recognizing um, similar characteristics that were happening as patients were testing the medicine. And they didn't come to it with a theory, but they saw that in data pattern. And then instead of just saying, yep, that's the, that's what's going to happen, they actually went out to look outside the um, that sample and saw that that data pattern actually occurred there and confirmed it holds up. And then that led to their research question to see, you know, is this a valid thing? Um, rather than just saying, oh, we see it in our tests, that means that, you know, that's, that's what's going to happen. Like, you don't want to just see something and say, yep, that's my research question. It's more of, I see it here, go broader out. Does it hold up when I see other um, data or places to see it? And then that can lead to your research question. And putting all that together, um, you know, he, he talks about, yeah, there's questions, but what's a good research question? And he talks about, they can come from a variety of ways. So just the source of it doesn't make it a good. So usually it comes from curiosity, but there's also theory. Um, and I was just reading, um, uh, the James Webb telescope is put on around, around a specific point, a Lagrange point, um, which is part of the three body part problem, which I'm still getting at understanding, but basically there's only five points where Earth, Sun, and Moon um, can exist, that they all stay where they are. And he, uh, the range when he did it basically said, I just did this out of curiosity. Like he has this whole like mathematical model that's built that's persisted for, you know, 300 years um, just out of curiosity. Um, but it could also come from a theory. So looking at a theory, and this is telling you what you should expect to see, um, or sorry, how the world works, what should you expect to see? And then sometimes opportunity, like you find the data patterns. You might be able to work with some data and then say, hey, what kind of questions does this data allow me to answer? Um, and the research questions really bring us from that theory to hypothesis that tells us the why behind the hypothesis to test. So I'm trying to figure out, I want to make sure I didn't say typo there, but tells us why we should test the hypothesis that we are testing. So again, just focusing on that why component. So he gave a list of five things to consider um, that makes it a good research question beyond 
answering the initial, you know, definition of it is potential results. If you can't find anything or say anything interesting about it, it's probably not worth your time in the capacity that the question itself and the theory you're, you're testing are not as closely linked as possible. So you might find some results, but if they're not really interesting, it's likely not the right question or linked question to the theory enough to explain how the world works. Um, feasibility, um, back to your point, Aaron, about, you know, collecting all the data in the world versus just, you know, enough. So is the research that you would need to um, conduct feasible um, to answer the question? You know, there's a possibility of potentially asking everybody their favorite movie and that versus realistically obtainable, whether that's a time constraint or so on. Um, you know, you don't really necessarily have that ability. Um, so scale, uh, the other one of feasibility are ones where you have to like track kids from age three to 18 and see where they are in the 15 years like that, you know, might not be as feasible as um, shorter term ones or something like that. Scale. So this is also a scope creep is, you know, consider time, resource constraints. If you have 10 years to work on this versus you have one term and a paper's due tomorrow or something like that's two extremes. But again, is your question, uh, it's part of that obtainable ability. Like you don't want to go too broad, um, too sophisticated um, in your design, finding a reasonable research design that can answer it and simplicity, keeping it simple. Um, example he provided here is not providing too many determinants into one. So asking, you know, what food is the healthiest, there's a lot of uh, factors that can go into defining what healthy is, and it's not necessarily there. So instead of saying, um, you know, broad research question like that, you could say it's more specifically of like, um, does drinking one to two cups of coffee daily over a course of a year um, impact um, blood pressure or something. I don't, and again, even that has a lot of other factors going on to it. But that was the um, general concepts from the first one is really just getting into thinking of the rationale of focusing on this, the research design and by spending so much time developing the question so that it is a good question will make sure that you design your research to get the right data to answer that question. And if you've done all this work and effort that the uh, question itself, the results either inform theory, tell you how the world works, um, or explain its why of a situation. Uh, there was some homework with chapter two. We could go through some of those questions with the time remaining, um, or we can open up the discussion or anything else that could be helpful to you all? Or did anyone take away anything that I did not cover uh, in these slides? I I just, I found it very refreshing that he sort of acknowledges that it's okay to go from question to theory or theory to question, or sometimes even data to question to theory. Um, I come from, you know, a depart the department where I did my PhD was very much like, you have to be designing your research question based on theory. Like it was very, very, very like, you have to be working from existing theory and coming up with your research question in order to answer that. Um, so I, myself and some of my friends spent a lot of time sort of fighting in defense of like what we would call exploratory research because in biology especially like our understanding there's i'm not saying that like going from theory to question is not useful it definitely is but like there's so much unknown that you have to do a level of exploratory sort of research question to theory or else you're just never going to get an understanding of how biology works in the world so i was like read that and was like vindicated <laughs> yeah that that's a, a great thing and coming from the real world outside of academia like there it, or even with school there is definitely more of a shift towards 
learning by experiment and trial and error versus you yeah. know just getting to the right thing. So I think it is a shift of and kind of this thought process of like, hey, it's okay to start this and end up answering it real quick, like, hey, this isn't the right way to go, and then go back to the drawing board and try a different question. Or, you know, if you have a theory, that's great, you start there, but you have questions, you can then, you know, go that route as well. So um, I, 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 much like with the rethinking statistics is that very kind of like, it's okay to try, mess up, try again, or update, you know, it's, that's a good way to learn and uh, build from there. Yeah, I think um, the the sort of important takeaway is that is just is sort of for me. It's like it doesn't matter where the question starts, like in in what sort of bucket it starts in. What matters is that you bring all of the appropriate um, components together before trying to like answer and before trying to like design your research. And stuff like that so like to me it doesn't matter if you start with a question or start with a theory but you have to be considering both of them when you're actually designing the research that's sort of where i kind of go for it yeah so in the chat if you can't figure out why you would ask a question that may not be a great research yeah. question yeah perfect Yeah, sorry, I have my R Studio open somewhere, but uh, I'll put that both of those co concepts right here and there. Yeah, last week I initially had taken quotes and filled these out, but then realized it says, you know, we'll just repeat the textbook. But yeah, there were some really great uh, quotes in there, like that uh, he repeats, like how the world works, like why the world works or how the world works. Like those are very ones, but this is a good one to add as well. So I'll put that in here just so I um I did get a feedback from uh, John when I pushed this that these slides might be too long and they don't show but when I go there all the content appears to be on there uh so I guess not because this one this one got cut off okay so um this is my first time doing this on this so apparently if you have to scroll it has a risk of cutting off. So what is a research question we ended with? Oh, I guess we could go over that. Okay. So I, I need to clarify on that of like how much is too much on the slide, but there was that concern. So these might have to go on different slides, but other than that, I, I will add the discussion or the comments made in the discussion at the end of it, but the directions at the bottom of the GitHub for um, the book club is pretty straightforward on how to do that. Have you done that, Aaron, if you end up doing that next week, or I can check with um, Sarah. Uh, she hasn't joined yet, but I can send a message to her. Yeah, like I said, I'll I'll, uh, I'll reach out to her um, on, on Teams, um, and I'll, I'll take care of the next two chapters if we, if, if need be. Yeah, and um, have you, have you done anything with the GitHub repository for the books before? For other other clubs, yeah, but not for not. For, I haven't really looked at the repository for this book yet. Okay, yeah, it, it, it's the same template. So if you've done it before, then it should be pretty straightforward. But the instructions right there in the README of, of it are um, exactly there. Uh, let me zoom in here. So these were just some of the homework questions that were available on the additional resources. Um, we can pick a few to go through or if there's any that are of interest. Um, these again, more of kind of being able to identify, you know, what we're looking at, what's a good question or something. So it might be good to kind of, we could look at these and kind of answer, you know, are these a good research question? And if so, why, why not? And I can pull up the, notes behind it and we can discuss through that or if there's other questions here. It looks like there's four questions, but do you all ever have the math teachers that are like, oh yeah, your homework's not long, it's only four questions. And then you open it up and like each question has like 26 subparts to it and ends up being like, you know, kind of like here, but, um, but yeah, so is that, if I lower that, so it fits on the screen and can you all still read that? 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So we're a little bit okay. Yeah, because I I think it's one of those concepts that he mentions throughout the book is that hey, this is pretty straightforward and easy until you actually go to do it, and then it's actually pretty hard. Um, Be, maybe being updated on current issues and constantly looking for opportunities could possibly be source for good question. Are you um, talking like to add to determining whether or not a question is good or not as if it's relevant to the current trends or updated based on newer data since original or? Yeah, no, not, not really. I was just uh, sharing uh, a thought. So, why not necessarily be added to the slide? Oh. Okay, got it. Okay, yeah, cool. Oh. Uh, just wanted to make sure I understood in the context on that. But yeah, that was one question that I had on like the longer term research ones is like you do all this work and on a five year research, for example, and two years in, somebody, you know, finds a altering or changes the theory on you. And it's like, how do you, you know, what do you do in that situation? But all right. So do severe hurricanes cause psychological disorders in children in gestation during? the hurricanes is this a good question or are there some things that we can adjust on it okay so could we answer this question Like does is there a set of data out there that if collected could answer this question? Seems like that would be really tough. And it would need to be more specific. Yes, yeah, so if the data was out there, it would be very if the data were out there, of course. Yeah. And I, I see some hmm. Well, uh, yeah. So like what what jumps out to me is the word cause <laughs> yeah. um with with the amount with the type of data that you would be able to collect for this you would never be able to get to causation because you can't run an experiment <laughs> on this like yeah I put most likely just because I never want to talk about absolutes, but, um, yeah. but yeah, that makes sense. I mean, what stood out for me was severe, like what is considered a severe hurricane. I could imagine somebody going to a category five, but relatively personally unimpacted, like maybe they're in a shelter versus in their hurricane category two and they're out in the middle of, you know, a wide open area or something that you know, they get caught up on, but um, that was kind of that ambiguous of, and then same thing with psychological disorders. I mean, I'm, a, I'm assuming there's probably more than a handful of psychological disorders. Yeah. Uh, yes. It's, it's way, way too, too broad. Um, yeah. I agree with the earlier comment that, yeah, you can't do this experiment, but I, right. A lot of causal inference is, is really about, I think, could you at least envision? <laughs> yeah. Although, you know, I guess in this case, you, you really <laughs> you couldn't really envision causing a hurricane and, and but um other issues too like what, what do we mean by that uh you know you could be in the eye of the storm essentially or you you know tangentially impacted by it there's just so many this is so broad is even if you could could tackle like the the experiment question like or could you envision an experiment uh, it, it's just so broad uh, across yeah. the board and this would um... Would this rely on interview rather than data basically saying, hey, if you were pregnant and were through a hurricane and your child was born, like, can we track what happens? Like, Yeah, this would be a longitudinal study, right? You're following up <laughs> children many years later after the hurricane. This this seems impossible <laughs> the more we talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think it necessarily would have to be because if you had a data set of like, individuals with psychological disorders and their birth dates you could figure out like when they were in gestation and whether or not a hurricane happened during that time mm -hmm. um so it's like theoretically possible 
And that was so that they were in that area and didn't weren't on vacation. Yeah. I mean, there would definitely be some assumptions. Um, Would it, if we did get an answer to this question, we were able to collect the data or whatever, like, would it change our understanding of the how the world or how the world works? Like, it could. I can think of a lot of like interesting things that you could potentially like. You could start to get at questions of like epigenetics. Um. Uh, issues like kind of going back to like how was how was the fetus impacted by the hurricane um you know maybe they were nutritionally stressed if um uh if they were not getting enough nutrition because of you know being evacuated or something like that but it could also be epigenetics like we know that stress during gestation can cause like epigenetic changes to a baby. So yeah, like I feel like you would need more specifics to the question in order to be able to get at that. Yeah, I guess also like why are we, is it just hurricanes that cause this or could it be tornadoes? Could it be some? Yeah. So I guess as a question. And also gestation is nine months and hurricane season is like what, five months? So theoretically, you could be exposed to multiple severe hurricanes during gestation. Would number of severe hurricanes make an impact? Um, yeah, so there's a lot of factors. <laughs> I, I think, you know, if you could answer this question, the, the benefit would really be like, well, how do you respond to this? If you're if you are yes. determining cause and effect here, you're, you're at least pretty, pretty uh, confident in that. Then it's kind of like, well, well, how do we? you know, address the issue, right? Is there special uh, treatment uh, for folks that have been exposed, uh, right, to hurricanes? Yeah, basically, like, what what, what could we do with these results? Um, to me, it would almost lead, I feel like it would lead to, okay, we found that there's a relationship with hurricanes. Could we maybe expend, extend that out to other natural disasters? Um, but... Um, so potential results, I mean, if we did have the data, which again, we've already failed, uh, we could not answer this, so it's not a research question, but, you know, I think there would be something interesting here if we found it, um, but I don't think it would be, uh, as an inform of theory, you know, hurricanes impact on psychological orders, uh, but feasibility would be, I mean, you mentioned that it's possible if we looked at birth rates and stuff, but realistically obtainable, uh, data is possible um, given birth records and dates of hurricanes and so on. Um, scale, again, with all that publicly available data, shouldn't be too much, but the design would be how would we research it? Simplicity. This is the one that I've really stood out to me was the multiple determinants. Like psychological disorders have a variety of, one, there's a variety of them, and two, um, you know, are there other causes that could be happening, genetic ones or other like you know, it's smoking or drinking or whatever else during hurricane or hurricanes during pregnancy um, and so on. So is there any way that you would reword this to make it a better question if it's even possible to do so? Realize I grabbed the most difficult one. Usually it starts easy to go. I think the dog B would be a better one, but. Yeah, I, I mean, you could do like, do children exposed to, I don't know, maybe like a category five or above. I don't actually know the hurricane categories. I, is it? Five is the most. Uh, yeah, five is the know. most. Okay, right. so maybe like four or above, five. I don't know. Anyways, pick a category. Um, you probably want a specific, uh, psychological disorder. You might yeah. even want to be specific about like what trimester the, the baby was yeah, in at the time yeah, of the yeah, hurricane. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, the psychological disorder one is fun because like, I don't know, man, if you look at the DSM, there's a lot of stuff in there that mm. there is widely in severity, right? Like, what do you mean by psychological disorder? Is it something as vanilla as like depression or is it, are you looking at like, you know, like schizophrenia or... It was interesting. Um, there was, I'll have to see if I can find the paper, but there was a paper that was recently released where they found that a lot of um, medical records are based off of hearsay uh, rather than actual, like, determination. So, you know, somebody might say, hey, I'm worried and I'm stressed. And it's like, okay, you have anxiety. Like, I think anxiety is like impacting majority of people. So, whereas 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, you know, people didn't really go see therapists as it's not as open or so on. So, you know, that would also be consideration of how many people did, do have psychological disorders that aren't, don't have a diagnosis of it as well um, and or disclose it in any capacity. And even like yeah. you know, some of these, there's severities of them. There's some that like, the, like with autism, for example, you have the high functioning to, you know, you're, you're very dependent. And um, so like, yeah, there's different ones there. Um, I think it would also um, would be good to track like a certain region or area. Um, so we would kind of want to know like, like, is this a last five years, 20 years? Um, you know, is there certain areas that we've seen severe, severe hurricanes hitting? Um, but also- I, I, th I think, yeah, your point is that there's a lot of confounding factors here. And yeah. I do think, you know, a lot of the models that we'll talk about try to take that into consideration to a degree. So you don't have to get a completely homogenous set of data, right? But but yeah, but there are, to your point, John, where I think you're getting at is there, there are so many confounding factors that it just makes this problem seem all, in, in, almost intractable. Yeah, like you can't design a yeah. to answer this question, I think is really where that feels. Which yeah. Is said in the beginning, in the first place. So, um Cool. I mean, you could probably like you could look at like Hurricane Katrina, maybe like specifically like localized into like the area impacted by Hurricane Katrina, or you could be like, you know, evacuees from Hurricane Katrina or something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, we have about two minutes left, so just kind of scrolling through here. Um, anyone have? any thoughts or feedback from this week or changes or updates or things I want to see for next week based on the slides or how this is set up? Yeah, I think this is good. I, I thought that was a, a nice thought prov provoking question. Uh, I, I don't think we need to just do the laundry list of homework, but questions, right. But there's an interesting one, uh, you know, or two, if we have time, that's, I think that makes sense to, to go through it. Yeah. And I, I would like for, from just from my perspective also to, provide more time so that we can look because there we will be getting into more practicals so less on the slides and more on the practicals but um kind of and these more conceptual ones it's more of did we were we able to address the learning objectives and these were a good way to solidify those but awesome so i will keep an eye on that but as it stands um if sarah's unable to uh, do next week for chapter three and four, then Aaron will pick up for it. Um, I will make the, I'll reach out to John to see what he meant about the cutting off on slides. Cause again, from my perspective on the site, it, nothing's cut off. So I'll just have to confirm on what that is. But other than that, um, chapter three and four, um, We'll be describing variables, describing research uh, relationships. There are the additional uh, homework that you can review through as you're going through and the videos as well. But thank you all for joining today. And um, if you think of anything between now and next week, uh, feel free to add it to the um, uh, Book Club Effect Slack channel. Take care and, and see you all next week. Thanks, John. Yeah, I'll, be, I'll be away next week. Um, I'll be on a train returning from the conference, but I will catch up. Um, with the video and everything before the following week. Sounds great. Take care, everyone.